Chapter Thirty One of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter Thirty One in which Fix, the detective, considerably furthers the interests of Phileas Fogg. Phileas Fogg found himself twenty hours behind time. Passed for two, the involuntary cause of this delay was desperate. He had ruined his master. At this moment the detective approached Mr. Fogg, and, looking him intently in the face, said, "'Seriously, sir, are you in great haste?' "'Quite seriously.' "'I have a purpose in asking,' resumed Fix. "'It is absolutely necessary that you should be in New York on the eleventh, "'before nine o'clock in the evening, "'the time that the steamer leaves for Liverpool?' "'It is absolutely necessary. "'And if your journey had not been interrupted by these Indians, "'you would have reached New York on the morning of the eleventh? "'Yes, with eleven hours to spare before the steamer left. "'Good.' You are, therefore, twenty hours behind. Twelve from twenty leaves eight. You must regain eight hours. Do you wish to try to do so? On foot? asked Mr. Fogg. No, on a sledge, replied Fix. On a sledge with sails. A man has proposed such a method to me. It was the man who had spoken to Fix during the night, and whose offer he had refused. Phileas Fogg did not reply at once, but Fix, having pointed out the man who was walking up and down in front of the station, Mr. Fogg went up to him. An instant after, Mr. Fogg and the American, whose name was Mudge, entered a hut built just below the fort. There Mr. Fogg examined a curious vehicle, a kind of frame on two long beams, a little raised in front like the runners of a sledge, and upon which there was room for five or six persons. A high mast was fixed on the frame, held firmly by metallic lashings, to which was attached a large brigantine sail. This mast held an iron stay upon which to hoist a jib-sail. Behind, a sort of rudder served to guide the vehicle. It was, in short, a sledge rigged like a sloop. During the winter, when the trains are blocked up by the snow, these sledges make extremely rapid journeys across the frozen plains from one station to another. Provided with more sails than a cutter, and with the wind behind them, they slip over the surface of the prairies with a speed equal, if not superior, to that of the express trains. Mr. Fogg readily made a bargain with the owner of this land craft. The wind was favorable, being fresh and blowing from the west. The snow had hardened, and Mudge was very confident of being able to transport Mr. Fogg in a few hours to Omaha. Thence the trains eastward run frequently to Chicago and New York. It was not impossible that the lost time might yet be recovered, and such an opportunity was not to be rejected. Not wishing to expose Aouda to the discomforts of traveling in the open air, Mr. Fogg proposed to leave her with Passepartout at Fort Kearney, the servant taking upon himself to escort her to Europe by a better route and under more favorable conditions. But Aouda refused to separate from Mr. Fogg, and Passepartout was delighted with her decision, for nothing could induce him to leave his master while Fix was with him. It would be difficult to guess the detective's thoughts. Was this conviction shaken by Phileas Fogg's return? or did he still regard him as an exceedingly shrewd rascal, who, his journey around the world completed, would think himself absolutely safe in England? Perhaps Fix's opinion of Phileas Fogg was somewhat modified, but he was nevertheless resolved to do his duty, and to hasten the return of the whole party to England as much as possible. At eight o'clock the sledge was ready to start. The passengers took their places on it and wrapped themselves up closely in their traveling cloaks. The two great sails were hoisted, and under the pressure of the wind the sledge slid over the hardened snow with a velocity of forty miles an hour. The distance between Fort Kearney and Omaha, as the birds fly, is at most two hundred miles. If the wind held good, the distance might be traversed in five hours. If no accident happened, the sledge might reach Omaha by one o'clock. What a journey! 
The travelers huddled close together could not speak for the cold, intensified by the rapidity at which they were going. The sledge sped on as lightly as a boat over the waves. When the breeze came skimming the earth, the sledge seemed to be lifted off the ground by its sails. Mudge, who was at the rudder, kept in a straight line, and by a turn of his hand checked the lurches which the vehicle had a tendency to make. All the sails were up, and the jib was so arranged as not to screen the brigantine. A topmast was hoisted, and another jib, held out to the wind, added its force to the other sails. Although the speed could not be exactly estimated, the sledge could not be going at less than forty miles an hour. "'If nothing breaks,' said Mudge, "'we shall get there.' Mr. Fogg had made it for Mudge's interest to reach Omaha within the time agreed on by the offer of a handsome reward. The prairie, across which the sledge was moving in a straight line, was as flat as a sea. It seemed like a vast, frozen lake. The railroad which ran through this section ascended from the southwest to the northwest by Great Island, Columbus, an important Nebraska town, Schuler, and Fremont, to Omaha. It followed throughout the right bank of the Platte River. The sledge, shortening this route, took a cord of the arc described by the railway. Mudge was not afraid of being stopped by the Platte River, because it was frozen. The road, then, was quite clear of obstacles, and Phileas Fogg had but two things to fear, an accident to the sledge, and a change or calm in the wind. But the breeze, far from lessening its force, blew as if to bend the mast, which, however, the metallic lashings held firmly. These lashings, like the chords of a stringed instrument, resounded as if vibrated by a violin bow. The sledge slid along in the midst of a plaintively intense melody. "'Those chords give the fifth and the octave,' said Mr. Fogg. These were the only words he uttered during the journey." Aouda, cosily packed in furs and cloaks, was sheltered as much as possible from the attacks of the freezing wind. As for Passepartout, his face was as red as the sun's disk when it sets in the mist, and he laboriously inhaled the biting air. With his natural buoyancy of spirits, he began to hope again. They would reach New York on the evening, if not on the morning of the eleventh, and there was still some chances that it would be before the steamer sailed for Liverpool. Passepartout even felt a strong desire to grasp his ally Fix by the hand. He remembered that it was the detective who procured the sledge, the only means of reaching Omaha in time, but checked by some presentiment he kept his usual reserve. One thing, however, Passepartout would never forget— and that was the sacrifice which Mr. Fogg had made without hesitation to rescue him from the Sioux. Mr. Fogg had risked his fortune and his life. No, his servant would never forget that. While each of the party was absorbed in reflections so different, the sledge flew over the vast carpet of snow. The creeks it passed over were not perceived. Fields and streams disappeared under the uniform whiteness. The plain was absolutely deserted. Between the Union Pacific Road and the branch which unites Kearney with St. Joseph, it formed a great uninhabited island. Neither village, station, nor fort appeared. From time to time they sped by some phantom-like tree, whose white skeleton twisted and rattled in the wind. Sometimes flocks of wild birds rose, or bands of gaunt, famished, ferocious prairie wolves ran howling after the sledge. Passepartout, revolver in hand, held himself ready to fire on those which came too near. Had an accident then happened to the sledge, the travelers attacked by these beasts would have been in the most terrible danger. But it held on its even course, soon gained on the wolves, and ere long left the howling band at a safe distance behind. About noon Mudge perceived by certain landmarks that he was crossing the Platte River. He said nothing but he felt certain that he was now within twenty miles of Omaha. In less than an hour he left the rudder and furled his sails, whilst the sledge, carried forward by the great impetus the wind had given it, went on half a mile further with its sails unspread. It stopped at last, and Mudge, 
pointing to a mass of roofs, white with snow, said, We have got there! Arrived! Arrived at the station, which is in daily communication by numerous trains with the Atlantic seaboard. Passepartout and Fix jumped off, stretched their stiffened limbs, and aided Mr. Fogg and the young woman to descend from the sledge. Phileas Fogg generously rewarded Mudge, whose hand Passepartout warmly grasped, and the party directed their steps to the Omaha Railway Station. The Pacific Railroad proper finds its terminus at this important Nebraska town. Omaha is connected with Chicago by the Chicago and Rock Island Railroad, which runs directly east and passes fifty stations. A train was ready to start when Mr. Fogg and his party reached the station, and they only had time to get into the cars. They had seen nothing of Omaha, but Passepartout confessed to himself that this was not to be regretted, as they were not traveling to see the sights. The train passed rapidly across the state of Iowa, by Council Bluffs, Des Moines, and Iowa City. During the night it crossed the Mississippi at Davenport, and by Rock Island entered Illinois. The next day, which was the tenth, at four o'clock in the evening, it reached Chicago, already risen from its ruins and more proudly seated than ever on the borders of its beautiful Lake Michigan. Nine hundred miles separated Chicago from New York, but trains are not wanting at Chicago. Mr. Fogg passed at once from one to the other, and the locomotive of the Pittsburgh, Fort Wayne, and Chicago Railway left at full speed, as if it fully comprehended that that gentleman had no time to lose. It traversed Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey like a flash, rushing through towns with antique names, some of which had streets and car tracks, but as yet no houses. At last the Hudson came into view, and at a quarter past eleven in the evening of the eleventh the train stopped in the station on the right bank of the river, before the very pier of the Cunard Line. The China, for Liverpool, had started three quarters of an hour before. End of chapter 31《Chapter Thirty Two of Around the World in Eighty Days》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Around the World in Eighty Days》by Jules Verne, translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter Thirty Two, in which Phileas Fogg engages in a direct struggle with bad fortune. The China, in leaving, seemed to have carried off Phileas Fogg's last hope. None of the other steamers were able to serve his projects. The Perrier of the French Transatlantic Company, whose admirable steamers are equal to any in speed and comfort, did not leave until the 14th. The Hamburg boats did not go directly to Liverpool or London, but to Harve, and the additional trip from Harve to Southampton would render Phileas Fogg's last efforts of no avail. The Inman steamer did not depart till the next day, and could not cross the Atlantic in time to save the wager. Mr. Fogg learned all this in consulting his Bradshaw, which gave him the daily movements of the transatlantic steamers. Passepartout was crushed. It overwhelmed him to lose the boat by three quarters of an hour. It was his fault, for instead of helping his master he had not ceased putting obstacles in his path, and when he recalled all the incidents of the tour, when he counted up the sums expended in pure loss and on his own account, when he thought that the immense stake added to the heavy charges of this useless journey would completely ruin Mr. Fogg, he overwhelmed himself with bitter self-accusations. Mr. Fogg, however, did not reproach him, and on leaving the Cunard Pier only said, "'We will consult about what is best to-morrow. Come.' The party crossed the Hudson in the Jersey City ferry boat and drove in a carriage to the St. Nicholas Hotel on Broadway. Rooms were engaged, and the night passed briefly to Phileas Fogg, who slept profoundly, but very long to Aouda and the others, whose agitation did not permit them to rest. The next day was the 12th of December. From seven in the morning of the 12th to a quarter before nine in the evening of the 21st, 
there were nine days, thirteen hours, and forty-five minutes. If Phileas Fogg had left in the China one of the fastest steamers on the Atlantic, he would have reached Liverpool and then London within the period agreed upon. Mr. Fogg left the hotel alone after giving Passepartout instructions to await his return and inform Aouda to be ready at an instant's notice. He proceeded to the banks of the Hudson, and looked about among the vessels moored or anchored in the river, for any that were about to depart. Several had departure signals and were preparing to put to sea at morning tide, for in this immense and admirable port there is not one day in a hundred that vessels do not set out for every quarter of the globe. But they were mostly sailing vessels, of which, of course, Phileas Fogg could make no use. He seemed about to give up all hope when he espied, anchored at the battery, a cable's length off at most, a trading vessel, with a screw well shaped, whose funnel puffing a cloud of smoke indicated that she was getting ready for departure. Phileas Fogg hailed a boat, got into it, and soon found himself on board the Henrietta, iron-hulled, wood-built above. He ascended to the deck, and asked for the captain, who forthwith presented himself. He was a man of fifty, a sort of sea-wolf, with big eyes, a complexion of oxidized copper, red hair and thick neck, and a growling voice. "'The captain?' asked Mr. Fogg. "'I am the captain.' "'I am Phileas Fogg of London.' "'And I am Andrew Speedy of Cardiff. You are going to put to sea?' "'In an hour. You are bound for Bordeaux.' "'And your cargo?' no freight, going in ballast. Have you any passengers? No passengers, never have passengers, too much in the way. Is your vessel a swift one? Between eleven and twelve knots. The Henrietta, well known. Will you carry me and three other persons to Liverpool? To Liverpool? Why not to China? I said Liverpool. No. No? No, I am setting out for Bordeaux, and shall go to Bordeaux. Money is no object? None. The captain spoke in a tone which did not admit of a reply. But the owners of the Henrietta, resumed Phileas Fogg. The owners are myself, replied the captain. The vessel belongs to me. I will freight it for you? No. I will buy it of you. No! Phileas Fogg did not betray the least disappointment, but the situation was a grave one. It was not at New York as at Hong Kong, nor with the captain of the Henrietta as with the captain of the Tankadier. Up to this time money had smoothed away every obstacle. Now money failed. Still, some means must be found across the Atlantic on a boat, unless by balloon which would have been venturesome, besides not being capable of being put in practice. It seemed that Phileas Fogg had an idea, for he said to the captain, "'Well, will you carry me to Bordeaux?' "'No, not if you paid me two hundred dollars.' "'I offer you two thousand. "'A piece? "'A piece. "'And there are four of you?' Four. Captain Speedy began to scratch his head. There were eight thousand dollars to gain without changing his route, for which it was well worth conquering the repugnance he had for all kinds of passengers. Besides, passengers at two thousand dollars are no longer passengers, but valuable merchandise. "'I start at nine o'clock,' said Captain Speedy, simply. "'Are you and your party ready?' "'We will be on board at nine o'clock.' replied no less simply mr fogg it was half past eight to disembark from the henrietta jump into a hack hurry to the st nicholas and return with aouda passepartout and even the inseparable fix was the work of a brief time and was performed by mr fogg with the coolness which never abandoned him they were on board when the henrietta was ready to weigh anchor when passepartout heard what this last voyage was going to cost he uttered a prolonged oh 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 which extended throughout his vocal gamut as for fix 
He said to himself that the Bank of England would certainly not come out of this affair well indemnified. When they reached England, even if Mr. Fogg did not throw some handfuls of bank bills into the sea, more than seven thousand pounds would have been spent. End of chapter 32《Chapter Thirty Three of Around the World in Eighty Days》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Around the World in Eighty Days》by Jules Verne, translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter Thirty Three, in which Phileas Fogg shows himself equal to the occasion. An hour after, the Henrietta passed the lighthouse which marks the entrance of the Hudson turned the point of Sandy Hook, and put to sea. During the day she skirted Long Island, passed Fire Island, and directed her course rapidly eastward. At noon the next day a man mounted the bridge to ascertain the vessel's position. It might be thought that this was Captain Speedy, not the least in the world. It was Phileas Fogg, Esquire. As for Captain Speedy, he was shut up in his cabin under lock and key, and was uttering loud cries which signified an anger at once pardonable and excessive. What had happened was very simple. Phileas Fogg wished to go to Liverpool, but the captain would not carry him there. Then Phileas Fogg had taken passage for Bordeaux, and during the thirty hours he had been on board had so shrewdly managed with his banknotes that the sailors and stokers, who were only an occasional crew, and were not on the best terms with the captain, went over to him in a body. This was why Phileas Fogg was in command, instead of Captain Speedy, why the captain was a prisoner in his cabin, and why, in short, the Henrietta was directing her course towards Liverpool. It was very clear, to see Mr. Fogg manage the craft, that he had been a sailor. How the adventure ended will be seen anon. Aouda was anxious, though she said nothing. As for Passepartout, he thought Mr. Fogg's maneuver simply glorious. The captain had said between eleven and twelve knots, and the Henrietta confirmed his prediction. If then, for there were ifs still, the sea did not become too boisterous, if the wind did not veer round to the east, if no accident happened to the boat or its machinery, the Henrietta might cross the three thousand miles from New York to Liverpool in the nine days between the twelfth and the twenty-first of December. It is true that once arrived the affair on board the Henrietta, added to that of the Bank of England, might create more difficulties for Mr. Fogg than he imagined or could desire. During the first days they went along smoothly enough. The sea was not very unpropitious. The wind seemed stationary in the northeast. The sails were hoisted, and the Henrietta ploughed across the waves like a real transatlantic steamer. Passepartout was delighted. His master's last exploit, the consequences of which he ignored, enchanted him. Never had the crew seen so jolly and dexterous a fellow. He formed warm friendships with the sailors, and amazed them with his acrobatic feats. He thought they managed the vessel like gentlemen, and that the stokers fired up like heroes. His loquacious good humor infected everyone. He had forgotten the past, its vexations and delays. He only thought of the end, so nearly accomplished, and sometimes he boiled over with impatience, as if heated by the furnaces of the Henrietta. Often also the worthy fellow revolved round Fix, looking at him with a keen, distrustful eye. But he did not speak to him, for their old intimacy no longer existed. Fix, it must be confessed, understood nothing of what was going on. The conquest of the Henrietta, the bribery of the crew, Fogg managing the boat like a skilled seaman, amazed and confused him. He did not know what to think, for, after all, a man who began by stealing fifty-five thousand pounds might end by stealing a vessel, and Fix was not unnaturally inclined to conclude that the Henrietta, under Fogg's command, was not going to Liverpool at all, but to some part of the world where the robber, turned into a pirate, would quietly put himself in safety. The conjecture was at least a plausible one, and the detective began to seriously regret that he had embarked on the affair. 
As for Captain Speedy, he continued to howl and growl in his cabin, and Passepartout, whose duty it was to carry him his meals, courageous as he was, took the greatest precautions. Mr. Fogg did not seem even to know that there was a captain on board. On the 13th they passed the edge of the banks of Newfoundland, a dangerous locality. During the winter, especially, there were frequent fogs and heavy gales of wind. Ever since the evening before, the barometer, suddenly falling, had indicated an approaching change in the atmosphere. And during the night the temperature varied, the cold became sharper, and the wind veered to the southeast. This was a misfortune. Mr. Fogg, in order not to deviate from his course, furled his sails and increased the force of the steam. But the vessel's speed slackened, owing to the state of the sea, the long waves of which broke against the stern. She pitched violently, and this retarded her progress. The breeze, little by little, swelled into a tempest, and it was to be feared that the Henrietta might not be able to maintain herself upright on the waves. Passepartout's visage darkened with the skies, and for two days the poor fellow experienced constant fright. But Phileas Fogg was a bold mariner, and knew how to maintain headway against the sea, and he kept on his course without even decreasing his steam. The Henrietta, when she could not rise above the waves, crossed them, swamping her deck, but passing safely. Sometimes the screw rose out of the water, beating its protruding end, when a mountain of water raised the stern above the waves, but the craft always kept straight ahead. The wind, however, did not grow as boisterous as might have been feared. It was not one of those tempests which burst and rush on with a speed of ninety miles an hour. It continued fresh, but unhappily it remained obstinately in the southeast, rendering the sails useless. The 16th of December was the 75th day since Phileas Fogg's departure from London, and the Henrietta had not yet been seriously delayed. Half of the voyage was almost accomplished, and the worst localities had been passed. In summer success would have been well-nigh certain. In winter they were at the mercy of the bad season. Passepartout said nothing, but he cherished hope in secret and comforted himself with the reflection that if the wind failed them they might still count on the steam. On this day the engineer came on deck, went up to Mr. Fogg, and began to speak earnestly with him. Without knowing why it was a presentiment, perhaps, Passepartout became vaguely uneasy. He would have given one of his ears to hear with the other what the engineer was saying. He finally managed to catch a few words, and was sure he heard his master say, you are certain of what you tell me? Certain, sir, replied the engineer. You must remember that since we started we have kept up hot fires in all our furnaces, and though we had coal enough to go on short steam from New York to Bordeaux, we haven't enough to go with all steam from New York to Liverpool. I will consider, replied Mr. Fogg. Passepartout understood it all. He was seized with mortal anxiety. The coal was giving out. "'Ah, oh, if my master can get over that,' muttered he, "'he'll be a famous man.' He could not help imparting to fix what he had overheard. "'Then you believe that we really are going to Liverpool?' "'Of course.' "'Ass,' replied the detective, shrugging his shoulders and turning on his heel. Passepartout was on the point of vigorously resenting the epithet, the reason of which he could not for the life of him comprehend, but he reflected that the unfortunate Fix was probably very much disappointed and humiliated in his self-esteem after having so awkwardly followed a false scent around the world, and refrained. And now what course would Phileas Fogg adopt? It was difficult to imagine. Nevertheless, he seemed to have decided upon one, for that evening he sent for the engineer and said to him, "'Feed all the fires until the coal is exhausted.' A few moments after, the funnel of the Henrietta vomited forth torrents of smoke. The vessel continued to proceed with all steam on. But on the 18th the engineer, as he had predicted, announced that the coal would give out in the course of the day. "'Do not let the fires go down,' replied Mr. Fogg. "'Keep them up to the last. Let the valves be filled.' Towards noon, Phileas Fogg, having ascertained their position, called Passepartout, and ordered him to go for Captain Speedy. 
It was as if the honest fellow had been commanded to unchain a tiger. He went to the poop, saying to himself, "'He will be like a madman!' In a few moments, with cries and oaths, a bomb appeared on the poop deck. The bomb was Captain Speedy. It was clear that he was on the point of bursting. "'Where are we?' were the first words his anger permitted him to utter. Had the poor man been an apoplectic, he could never have recovered from his paroxysm of wrath. "'Where are we?' he repeated with purple face. Seven hundred and seven miles from Liverpool,' replied Mr. Fogg with imperturbable calmness. "'Pirate!' cried Captain Speedy. "'I have sent for you, sir. Pecaroon! "'Sir,' continued Mr. Fogg, "'to ask you to sell me your vessel.' "'No, by all devils, no. "'But I shall be obliged to burn her.' "'Burn the Henrietta?' "'Yes, at least the upper part of her. "'The coal has given out.' "'Burn my vessel!' cried Captain Speedy, "'who could scarcely pronounce the words. "'A vessel worth fifty thousand dollars?' "'Here are sixty thousand, replied Phileas Fogg, "'handing the captain a roll of bank bills.' This had a prodigious effect on Andrew Speedy. An American can scarcely remain unmoved at the sight of sixty thousand dollars. The captain forgot in an instant his anger, his imprisonment, and all his grudges against his passenger. The Henrietta was twenty years old. It was a great bargain. The bomb would not go off after all. Mr. Fogg had taken away the match. "'And I shall still have the iron hull,' said the captain in a softer tone the iron hull, and the engine. Is it agreed? Agreed. And Andrew Speedy, seizing the bank notes, counted them and consigned them to his pocket. During this colloquy, Passepartout was as white as a sheet, and Fix seemed on the point of having an apoplectic fit. Nearly twenty thousand pounds had been expended, and Fogg left the hull and engine to the captain. That is, near the whole value of the craft, it was true, however, that fifty-five thousand pounds had been stolen from the bank. When Andrew Speedy had pocketed the money, Mr. Fogg said to him, "'Don't let this astonish you, sir. You must know that I shall lose twenty thousand pounds unless I arrive in London by a quarter before nine on the evening of the twenty-first of December. I missed the steamer at New York, and as you refused to take me to Liverpool—' "'And I did well,' cried Andrew Speedy for I have gained at least forty thousand dollars by it. He added more sedately, Do you know one thing, Captain Fogg? Captain Fogg, you've got something of the Yankee about you. And having paid his passenger what he considered a high compliment, he was going away when Mr. Fogg said, The vessel now belongs to me? Certainly, from the keel to the truck of the mass. All the wood, that is. Very well. Have the interior seats, bunks, and frames pulled down and burn them. It was necessary to have dry wood to keep the steam up to the adequate pressure, and on that day the poop, cabins, bunks, and the spare deck were sacrificed. On the next day, the 19th of December, the masts, rafts, and spars were burned. The crew worked lustily, keeping up the fires. Passepartout hewed, cut, and sawed away with all his might, there was a perfect rage for demolition. The railings, fittings, the greater part of the deck and top sides disappeared on the twentieth, and the Henrietta was now only a flat hulk. But on this day they sighted the Irish coast and fast-net light. By ten in the evening they were passing Queenstown. Phileas Fogg had only twenty-four hours more in which to get to London. That length of time was necessary to reach Liverpool with all the steam on, and the steam was about to give out altogether. "'Sir,' said Captain Speedy, who was now deeply interested in Mr. Fogg's project, "'I really commiserate with you. Everything is against you. We are only opposite Queenstown.' "'Ah,' said Mr. Fogg, "'is that the place where we see the lights, Queenstown?' "'Yes.' "'Can we enter the harbor? Not under three hours, only at high tide.' "'Stay,' replied Mr. Fogg calmly, without betraying in his features that by a supreme inspiration he was about to attempt once more to conquer ill-fortune. 
Queenstown is the Irish port at which the transatlantic steamers stop to put off the mails. These mails are carried to Dublin by express trains, always held in readiness to start. From Dublin they are sent on to Liverpool by the most rapid boats, and thus gain twelve hours on the Atlantic steamers. Phileas Fogg counted on gaining twelve hours in the same way. Instead of arriving at Liverpool the next evening by the Henrietta, he would be there by noon, and would therefore have time to reach London before a quarter before nine in the evening. The Henrietta entered Queenstown Harbour at one o'clock in the morning, it then being high tide, and Phileas Fogg, after being grasped heartily by the hand by Captain Speedy, left that gentleman on the levelled hulk of his craft, which was still worth half what he had sold it for. The party went on shore at once. Fix was greatly tempted to arrest Mr. Fogg on the spot, but he did not. Why? What struggle was going on within him? Had he changed his mind about his man? Did he understand that he had made a grave mistake? He did not, however, abandon Mr. Fogg. They all got upon the train, which was just ready to start, at half-past one. At dawn of day they were in Dublin, and they lost no time in embarking on a steamer, which, disdaining to rise upon the waves, invariably cut through them. Phileas Fogg at last disembarked on the Liverpool quay at twenty minutes before twelve, twenty-first of December. He was only six hours distant from London. But at this moment Fix came up, put his hand upon Mr. Fogg's shoulder, and showing his warrant said, "'You are really Phileas Fogg?' "'I am. I arrest you in the Queen's name.'" End of chapter 33《Chapter 34 of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter 34 In Which Phileas Fogg At Last Reaches London. Phileas Fogg was in prison. He had been shut up in the custom house, and he was to be transferred to London the next day. Passepartout, when he saw his master arrested, would have fallen upon Fix had he not been held back by some policemen. Aouda was thunderstruck at the suddenness of an event which she could not understand. Passepartout explained to her how it was that the honest and courageous Fogg was arrested as a robber. The young woman's heart revolted against so heinous a charge, and when she saw that she could attempt to do nothing to save her protector, she wept bitterly. As for Fix, he had arrested Mr. Fogg, because it was his duty, whether Mr. Fogg were guilty or not. The thought then struck Passepartout that he was the cause of this new misfortune. Had he not concealed Fix's errand from his master? When Fix revealed his true character and purpose, why had he not told Mr. Fogg? If the latter had been warned, he would no doubt have given Fix proof of his innocence, and satisfied him of his mistake. At least Fix would not have continued his journey at the expense and on the heels of his master, only to arrest him the moment he set foot on English soil. Passepartout wept till he was blind, and felt like blowing his brains out. Aouda and he had remained, despite the cold, under the portico of the custom-house. Neither wished to leave the place. Both were anxious to see Mr. Fogg again. That gentleman was really ruined and that at the moment when he was about to attain his end. This arrest was fatal. Having arrived at Liverpool at twenty minutes before twelve on the twenty-first of December, he had till a quarter before nine that evening to reach the Reform Club, that is, nine hours and a quarter. The journey from Liverpool to London was six hours. If any one at this moment had entered the Custom House, he would have found Mr. Fogg seated, motionless, calm, and without apparent anger, upon a wooden bench. He was not, it is true, resigned, but this last blow failed to force him into an outward betrayal of any emotion. Was he being devoured by one of those secret rages, all the more terrible because contained, and which only burst forth with an irresistible force at the last moment? No one could tell. There he sat, calmly waiting. For what? Did he still cherish hope? 
Did he still believe, now that the door of this prison was closed upon him, that he would succeed? However that may have been, Mr. Fogg carefully put his watch upon the table and observed its advancing hands. Not a word escaped his lips, but his look was singularly set and stern. The situation, in any event, was a terrible one, and might be thus stated. If Phileas Fogg was honest, he was ruined. If he was a knave, he was caught. Did escape occur to him? Did he examine to see if there were any practicable outlet from his prison? Did he think of escaping from it? Possibly. For once he walked slowly around the room. But the door was locked and the window heavily barred with iron rods. He sat down again and drew his journal from his pocket. On the line where these words were written, 21st December, Saturday, Liverpool, he added, 80th day, 11.40 a.m., and waited. The custom-house clock struck one. Mr. Fogg observed that his watch was two hours too fast. Two hours! Admitting that he was at this moment taking an express train, he could reach London and the Reform Club by a quarter before nine p.m. His forehead slightly wrinkled. At thirty-three minutes past two, he heard a singular noise outside, then a hasty opening of doors. Passepartout's voice was audible, and immediately after that of Fix. Phileas Fogg's eyes brightened for an instant. The door swung open, and he saw Passepartout, Aouda, and Fix, who hurried towards him. Fix was out of breath, and his hair was in disorder. He could not speak. Sir, he stammered, sir, forgive me. Most unfortunate resemblance. Robber arrested three days ago. You are free. Phileas Fogg was free. He walked to the detective, looked him steadily in the face, and with the only rapid motion he had ever made in his life, or which he ever would make, drew back his arms, and with the precision of a machine, knocked Fix down. "'Well hit!' cried Passepartout. "'Parbleu! That's what you might call a good application of English fists!' Fix, who found himself on the floor, did not utter a word. He had only received his deserts. Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout left the custom house without delay, got into a cab, and in a few moments descended at the station. Phileas Fogg asked if there was an express train about to leave for London. It was forty minutes past two. The express train had left thirty-five minutes before. Phileas Fogg then ordered a special train. There were several rapid locomotives on hand, but the railway arrangements did not permit the special train to leave until three o'clock. At that hour Phileas Fogg, having stimulated the engineer by the offer of a generous reward, at last set out towards London with Aouda and his faithful servant. It was necessary to make the journey in five hours and a half, and this would have been easy on a clear road throughout, but there were forced delays, and when Mr. Fogg stepped from the train at the terminus all the clocks in London were striking ten minutes before nine. Having made the tour of the world, he was behindhand five minutes. He had lost the wager. End of chapter 34「Chapter 35 of Around the World in Eighty Days – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 35 In Which Phileas Fogg Does Not Have to Repeat His Orders to Passepartout Twice The dwellers in Seville Row would have been surprised the next day if they had been told that Phileas Fogg had returned home. His doors and windows were still closed. No appearance of change was visible. After leaving the station, Mr. Fogg gave Passepartout instructions to purchase some provisions, and quietly went to his domicile. He bore his misfortune with his habitual tranquillity, ruined, and by the blundering of the detective. After having steadily traversed that long journey, overcome a hundred obstacles, braved many dangers, and still found time to do some good on his way, to fail near the goal by a sudden event, which he could not have foreseen, and against which he was unarmed, it was terrible but a few pounds were left of the large sum he had carried with him. 
There only remained of his fortune the twenty thousand pounds deposited at Bearings, and this amount he owed to his friends of the Reform Club. So great had been the expense of his tour that even had he won it would not have enriched him, and it is probable that he had not sought to enrich himself, being a man who rather laid wagers for honor's sake than for the stake proposed. But this wager totally ruined him. Mr. Fogg's course, however, was fully decided upon. He knew what remained for him to do. A room in the house in Seville Row was set apart for Aouda, who was overwhelmed with grief at her protector's misfortune. From the words which Mr. Fogg dropped, she saw that he was meditating some serious project. Knowing that Englishmen governed by a fixed idea sometimes resort to the desperate expedient of suicide, Passepartout kept a narrow watch upon his master, though he carefully concealed the appearance of so doing. First of all, the worthy fellow had gone up to his room, and had extinguished the gas burner, which had been burning for eighty days. He had found in the letter-box a bill from the gas company, and he thought it more than time to put a stop to this expense, which he had been doomed to bear. The night passed. Mr. Fogg went to bed. But did he sleep? Aouda did not once close her eyes. Passepartout watched all night, like a faithful dog, at his master's door. Mr. Fogg called him in the morning, and told him to get Aouda's breakfast, and a cup of tea and a chop for himself. He desired Aouda to excuse him from breakfast and dinner, as his time would be absorbed all day in putting his affairs to rights. In the evening he would ask permission to have a few moments' conversation with the young lady. Passepartout, having received his orders, had nothing to do but obey them. He looked at his imperturbable master, and could scarcely bring his mind to leave him. His heart was full, and his conscience tortured by remorse for he accused himself more bitterly than ever of being the cause of the irretrievable disaster. Yes, if he had warned Mr. Fogg, and had betrayed Fix's projects to him, his master would certainly not have given the detective passage to Liverpool, and then Passepartout could hold in no longer. "'My master, Mr. Fogg!' he cried. "'Why do you not curse me? It was my fault that—' "'I blame no one,' returned Phileas Fogg, with perfect calmness. "'Go!' Passepartout left the room and went to find Aouda, to whom he delivered his master's message. "'Madam,' he added, "'I can do nothing myself, nothing. I have no influence over my master. But you, perhaps—' "'What influence could I have?' replied Aouda. "'Mr. Fogg is influenced by no one.' Has he ever understood that my gratitude to him is overflowing? Has he ever read my heart? My friend, he must not be left alone an instant. You say he is going to speak with me this evening? Yes, madam, probably to arrange for your protection and comfort in England. We shall see, replied Aouda, becoming suddenly pensive. Throughout this day, Sunday, the house in Seville Row was as if uninhabited and Phileas Fogg, for the first time since he had lived in that house, did not set out for his club when Westminster clock struck half-past eleven. Why should he present himself at the reform? His friends no longer expected him there. As Phileas Fogg had not appeared in the saloon on the evening before, Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before nine, he had lost his wager. It was not even necessary that he should go to his bankers for the twenty thousand pounds, for his antagonists already had his check in their hands, and they had only to fill it out and send it to the bearings to have the amount transferred to their credit. Mr. Fogg, therefore, had no reason for going out, and so he remained at home. He shut himself up in his room, and busied himself putting his affairs in order. Passepartout continually ascended and descended the stairs. The hours were long for him. He listened at his master's door, and looked through the keyhole, as if he had a perfect right so to do, and as if he feared that something terrible might happen at any moment. Sometimes he thought of Fix, but no longer in anger. Fix, like all the world, had been mistaken in Phileas Fogg, and had only done his duty in tracking and arresting him, while he, Passepartout, this thought haunted him. 
and he never ceased cursing his miserable folly. Finding himself too wretched to remain alone, he knocked at Aouda's door, went into her room, seated himself without speaking in a corner, and looked ruefully at the young woman. Aouda was still pensive. About half-past seven in the evening Mr. Fogg sent to know if Aouda would receive him, and in a few moments he found himself alone with her. Phileas Fogg took a chair and sat down near the fireplace opposite Aouda. No emotion was visible on his face. Fogg returned was exactly the Fogg who had gone away. There was the same calm, the same impassibility. He sat several minutes without speaking. Then, bending his eyes on Aouda, Madam, said he, will you pardon me for bringing you to England? I, Mr. Fogg, replied Aouda, checking the pulsations of her heart. Please let me finish, returned Mr. Fogg. When I decided to bring you far away from the country which was so unsafe for you, I was rich and counted on putting a portion of my fortune at your disposal. Then your existence would have been free and happy. But now I am ruined. I know it, Mr. Fogg, replied Aouda, and I ask you in my turn, will you forgive me for having followed you, and, who knows, for having perhaps delayed you, and thus contributed to your ruin? Madam, you could not remain in India and your safety could only be assured by bringing you to such a distance that your persecutors could not take you. So, Mr. Fogg, resumed Aouda, not content with rescuing me from a terrible death, you thought yourself bound to secure my comfort in a foreign land? Yes, madam, but circumstances have been against me. Still, I beg to place the little I have left at your service. But what will become of you, Mr. Fogg? "'As for me, madam,' replied the gentleman coldly, "'I have need of nothing.' "'But how do you look upon the fate, sir, which awaits you?' "'As I am in the habit of doing.' "'At least,' said Aouda, "'want should not overtake a man like you. "'Your friends—' "'I have no friends, madam.' "'Your relatives?' "'I have no longer any relatives.' "'I pity you, then, Mr. Fogg.' for solitude is a sad thing, with no heart to which to confide your griefs. They say, though, that misery itself, shared by two sympathetic souls, may be borne with patience. They say so, madam. Mr. Fogg, said Aouda, rising and seizing his hand, do you wish at once a kinswoman and friend? Will you have me for your wife? Mr. Fogg at this rose in his turn. There was an unwanted light in his eyes, and a slight trembling of his lips. Aouda looked into his face. The sincerity, rectitude, firmness, and sweetness of this soft glance of a noble woman, who could dare all to save him to whom she owed all, at first astonished and then penetrated him. He shut his eyes for an instant, as if to avoid her look. When he opened them again, I love you, he said, simply. Yes, by all that is holiest, I love you, and I am entirely yours. Ah! Oh, cried Aouda, pressing his hand to her heart. Passepartout was summoned and appeared immediately. Mr. Fogg still held Aouda's hand in his own. Passepartout understood, and his big round face became as radiant as the tropical sun at its zenith. Mr. Fogg asked him if it was not too late to notify the Reverend Samuel Wilson of Marylebone Parish that evening. Passepartout smiled his most genial smile and said, Never too late. It was five minutes past eight. Will it be for tomorrow, Monday? For tomorrow, Monday, said Mr. Fogg, turning to Aouda. Yes, for tomorrow, Monday, she replied. Passepartout hurried off as fast as his legs would carry him. End of chapter 35《Chapter Thirty Six of Around the World in Eighty Days》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne, translated by George Makepeace Towell. — Chapter Thirty Six, in which Phileas Fogg's name is once more at a premium on change. 
It is time to relate what a change took place in English public opinion when it transpired that the real bank robber, a certain James Strand, had been arrested on the seventeenth day of December at Edinburgh. Three days before, Phileas Fogg had been a criminal who was being desperately followed up by the police. Now he was an honorable gentleman, mathematically pursuing his eccentric journey around the world. The papers resumed their discussion about the wager. All those who had laid bets for or against him revived their interest. As if by magic, the Phileas Fogg bonds again became negotiable, and many new wagers were made. Phileas Fogg's name was once more at a premium on change. His five friends of the Reform Club passed these three days in a state of feverish suspense. Would Phileas Fogg, whom they had forgotten, reappear before their eyes? Where was he at this moment? The 17th of December, the day of James Strand's arrest, was the 76th since Phileas Fogg's departure, and no news of him had been received. Was he dead? Had he abandoned the effort? Or was he continuing his journey along the route agreed upon? And would he appear on Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before nine in the evening, on the threshold of the Reform Club saloon? The anxiety in which, for three days, London society existed cannot be described. Telegrams were sent to America and Asia for news of Phileas Fogg. Messengers were dispatched to the house in Seville Row, morning and evening. No news. The police were ignorant what had become of the detective Fix, who had so unfortunately followed up a false scent. Bets increased, nevertheless, in number and value. Phileas Fogg, like a racehorse, was drawing near his last turning point. The bonds were quoted no longer at a hundred below par, but at twenty, at ten, and at five, and paralytic old Lord Albemarle bet even in his favor. A great crowd was collected in Pall Mall and the neighboring streets on Saturday evening. It seemed like a multitude of brokers permanently established around the Reform Club. Circulation was impeded, and everywhere disputes, discussions, and financial transactions were going on. The police had great difficulty in keeping back the crowd, and as the hour when Phileas Fogg was due approached, the excitement rose to its highest pitch. The five antagonists of Phileas Fogg had met in the great saloon of the club, John Sullivan and Samuel Follentine, the bankers, Andrew Stewart, the engineer, Gauthier Ralph, the director of the Bank of England, and Thomas Flanagan, the brewer, one and all waited anxiously. When the clock indicated twenty minutes past eight, Andrew Stewart got up, saying, "'Gentlemen, in twenty minutes the time agreed upon between Mr. Fogg and ourselves will have expired.' "'What time did the last train arrive from Liverpool?' asked Thomas Flanagan. "'At twenty-three minutes past seven, replied Gauthier Ralph, "'and the next does not arrive till ten minutes after twelve. "'Well, gentlemen,' resumed Andrew Stewart, "'if Phileas Fogg had come in the 723 train, "'he would have got here by this time. "'We can, therefore, regard the bet as one. "'Wait, don't let us be too hasty,' replied Samuel Fallentine. You know that Mr. Fogg is very eccentric. His punctuality is well known. He never arrives too soon or too late, and I should not be surprised if he appeared before us at the last minute. Why, said Andrew Stewart nervously, if I should see him I should not believe it was he. The fact is, resumed Thomas Flanagan, Mr. Fogg's project was absurdly foolish. Whatever his punctuality, he could not prevent the delays which were certain to occur, and a delay of only two or three days would be fatal to his tour. Observe, too, added John Sullivan, that we have received no intelligence from him, though there are telegraphic lines all along his route. He has lost, gentlemen, said Andrew Stewart. He has a hundred times lost. You know, besides, that the China, the only steamer he could have taken from New York to get here in time, arrived yesterday. I have seen a list of the passengers— and the name of Phileas Fogg is not among them. Even if we admit that fortune has favored him, he can scarcely have reached America. I think he will be at least twenty days behind hand, and that Lord Albemarle will lose a cool five thousand. It is clear, replied Gauthier Rao, and we have nothing to do but to present Mr. Fogg's check at Barings to-morrow. 
At this moment the hands of the club clock pointed to twenty minutes to nine. Five minutes more,' said Andrew Stewart. The five gentlemen looked at each other. Their anxiety was becoming intense, but not wishing to betray it they readily assented to Mr. Fallentine's proposal of a rubber. "'I wouldn't give up my four thousand of the bet,' said Andrew Stewart, as he took his seat, "'for three thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine. The clock indicated eighteen minutes to nine. The players took up their cards, but could not keep their eyes off the clock. Certainly, however, secure they felt, minutes had never seemed so long to them. Seventeen minutes to nine, said Thomas Flanagan, as he cut the cards which Ralph handed to him. Then there was a moment of silence. The great saloon was perfectly quiet, but the murmurs of the crowd outside were heard, with now and then a shrill cry. The pendulum beat the seconds, which each player eagerly counted, as he listened, with mathematical regularity. Sixteen minutes to nine, said John Sullivan, in a voice which betrayed his emotion. One minute more, and the wager would be won. Andrew Stewart and his partners suspended their game. They left their cards and counted the seconds. At the fortieth second, nothing. At the fiftieth, still nothing. At the fifty-fifth, a loud cry was heard in the street, followed by applause, hurrahs, and some fierce growls. The players rose from their seats. At the fifty-seventh second the door of the saloon opened, and the pendulum had not beat the sixtieth second when Phileas Fogg appeared, followed by an excited crowd who had forced their way through the club doors, and in his calm voice said, "'Here I am, gentlemen.'" End of chapter 36「Chapter thirty seven of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter thirty seven. In which it is shown that Phileas Fogg gained nothing by his tour around the world unless it were happiness. Yes, Phileas Fogg in person. The reader will remember that at five minutes past eight in the evening, about five and twenty hours after the arrival of the travellers in London, Passport Two had been sent by his master to engage the services of the Reverend Samuel Wilson in a certain marriage ceremony which was to take place the next day. Passport Two went on his errand enchanted. He soon reached the clergyman's house, but found him not at home. Passport Two waited a good twenty minutes and when he left the reverend gentleman it was thirty-five minutes past eight. But in what a state he was, with his hair in disorder and without his hat, he ran along the street as never man was seen to run before, overturning passers-by, rushing over the sidewalk like a waterspout. In three minutes he was in Seville Row again, and staggered back into Mr. Fogg's room. He could not speak. "'What is the matter?' asked Mr. Fogg. "'My master!' gasped Passepartout. "'Marriage!' impossible 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 for to-morrow why so because to-morrow is sunday monday replied mr fogg no to-day is saturday saturday impossible yes 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 cried passepartout you have made a mistake of one day we arrived twenty-four hours ahead of time but there are only ten minutes left Passepartout had seized his master by the collar and was dragging him along with irresistible force. Phileas Fogg, thus kidnapped without having time to think, left his house, jumped into a cab, promised a hundred pounds to the cabman, and having run over two dogs and overturned five carriages, reached the reform club. The clock indicated a quarter before nine when he appeared in the great saloon. Phileas Fogg had accomplished the journey round the world in eighty days. Phileas Fogg had won his wager of twenty thousand pounds. How was it that a man so exact and fastidious could have made this error of a day? How came he to think that he had arrived in London on Saturday, the twenty-first day of December, when it was really Friday, the twentieth, the seventy-ninth day only from his departure? The cause of the error is very simple. Phileas Fogg had, without suspecting it, gained one day on his journey 
and this merely because he had traveled constantly eastward. He would, on the contrary, have lost the day had he gone in the opposite direction, that is, westward. In journeying eastward he had gone towards the sun, and the days, therefore, diminished for him as many times four minutes as he crossed the degrees in this direction. There are three hundred and sixty degrees on the circumference of the earth, and these three hundred and sixty degrees multiplied by four minutes gives precisely twenty-four hours, that is, the day unconsciously gained. In other words, while Phileas Fogg, going eastward, saw the sun pass the meridian eighty times, his friends in London only saw it pass the meridian seventy-nine times. This is why they awaited him at the Reform Club on Saturday, and not Sunday, as Mr. Fogg thought. And Passepartout's famous family watch, which had always kept London time, would have betrayed this fact, if it had marked the days as well as the hours and the minutes. Phileas Fogg, then, had won the twenty thousand pounds, but as he had spent nearly nineteen thousand on the way, the pecuniary gain was small. His object was, however, to be victorious and not to win money. He divided the one thousand pounds that remained between Passepartout and the unfortunate Fix, against whom he cherished no grudge. He deducted, however, from Passepartout's share the cost of the gas, which had burned in his room for nineteen hundred and twenty hours, for the sake of regularity. That evening Mr. Fogg, as tranquil and phlegmatic as ever, said to Aouda, is our marriage still agreeable to you? Mr. Fogg, replied she, it is for me to ask that question. You were ruined, but now you are rich again. Pardon me, madam, my fortune belongs to you. If you had not suggested our marriage, my servant would not have gone to the Reverend Samuel Wilson's. I should not have been apprised of my error, and— Dear Mr. Fogg, said the young woman. Dear Aouda, replied Phileas Fogg. It need not be said that the marriage took place forty-eight hours after, and that Passepartout, glowing and dazzling, gave the bride away. Had he not saved her, and was he not entitled to this honor? The next day, as soon as it was light, Passepartout rapped vigorously at his master's door. Mr. Fogg opened it and asked, "'What's the matter, Passepartout?' "'What is it, sir? Why, I've just this instant found out—' "'What?' that we might have made the tour of the world in only seventy-eight days. No doubt, returned Mr. Fogg, by not crossing India. But if I had not crossed India, I should not have saved Aouda. She would not have been my wife, and— Mr. Fogg quietly shut the door. Phileas Fogg had won his wager, and had made his journey around the world in eighty days. To do this he had employed every means of conveyance steamers, railways, carriages, yachts, trading vessels, sledges, elephants. The eccentric gentleman had throughout displayed all his marvelous qualities of coolness and exactitude. But what then? What had he really gained by all this trouble? What had he brought back from this long and weary journey? Nothing, you say? Perhaps so. Nothing but a charming woman, who, strange as it may appear, made him the happiest of men. Truly, would you not for less than that make the tour around the world? End of chapter 37 End of Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Recording by Ralph J. Snelson Springville, Utah Email ralphsnelson at q dot com